While it seems like just yesterday, it was 24 years ago that I first stood in this chamber, raised my right hand, and took the oath of office as a state representative. Like all of you, I had a profound uh, and deep sense of privilege and responsibility. I hope that in some small ways, I was not only able to serve with you, but to serve you. I thank you for the countless ways you have made me a better legislator, a better public servant, and more hopeful for our democracy. I wish you much joy and success as you face the Commonwealth's important and unfinished business. Thank you. I met Jay 36 years ago. Jay has been ensuring that he would um, be a revolutionary coming out of Lexington. He absolutely has been a champion for every progressive cause. The gay marriage movement, uh, the universal health care movement, for the whole country, by the way, well, Jay was serving there. And he has fought as hard as any human being has ever fought to reform the tax system in this state uh, so that it's more fair, more just, more humane, more progressive. Uh, and we're all in his debt for the incredible effort that he has made throughout his career. Thank you, Jay, for everything that you have done. Yeah. My first office was in that corner way back there. Well, to call it an office is to overstate the case. My cubicle was in that office. I think my interest in social and economic justice has as much to do with the family I grew up in as anything else. My parents were both immigrants having escaped Nazi Germany and thought of this country as having saved their lives, which it literally did. And their sense of idealism that goes with American patriotism was second to none. So I grew up with a real sense of it being important to be part of a community where people cared for one another and where there was some justice and kindness. Religious sentiments and religious practices wound up shaping my early life. So every Saturday, I would go to after services with my father, getting ready for my bar mitzvah was a major ordeal, major focus for time and energy. Somehow or other, I don't know exactly how this was arranged, but Torahs are not only sacred, but once they're blemished in any way, they're no longer kosher. We wound up with an unkosher Torah at home, and I practiced my Torah reading on a real Torah. That was pretty intense, living with a Torah in my bedroom for a year. So it was a big deal. So welcome to my office. Uh, this has been my perch for the last 10 years. It uh, is associated with the chairmanship of the Committee on Revenue, uh, which I have held for all this time. It's one of the largest offices in the building and larger than many apartments that I've lived in. Well, I was living in Holland with my family as I was a senior in high school. I had, my family had moved to Holland when I was midway through my 10th grade. So I was doing the whole college application routine at a distance without really much understanding of what I was doing. There was, I remember distinctly, a little black book, or not such a little black book, but a guide to all the colleges and universities in the country. And I leafed through there and picked out some that looked interesting from, the, from whatever point of view I was offering at the time. And Brandeis was most intriguing of the ones that decided they were gonna give me admittance. I also really liked the DNA of that institution of Brandeis with its serious commitment to social and economic justice. For the most part, 
the photos are either artwork that I enjoy or family that I love, or in the case of three of the um, framed pieces here, my wall of heroes. So uh, Bobby Kennedy, Leonard Bernstein, and Abe Lincoln are, are here to remind me of my debts. Yeah, in terms of my evolving political consciousness, I remember distinctly writing my college application letters and filling out forms with the beat of John Kennedy's funeral cortege echoing in my head. So, remember it as if it were yesterday and sort of watched every minute of all those proceedings late in 63 and that was very much in the air in my mind in my heart when I was applying to college and then both Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were killed so those bracket my college years. I looked around me as I was starting to be politically conscious of and aware of the world as it really was. And I grew up at a time of enormous strife around civil rights issues. We were newly aware of the racism in this country and Martin Luther King's efforts to address that. And then there was the small matter of our uh, ill-fated and ill-advised war in Vietnam. So there was this enormous disconnect between my sense of youthful idealism and some of my anger and cynicism, disappointment at how far we were off the mark. Well, I found that picture at the Kennedy Library down at Columbia Point, and I've not seen it anywhere else, but what I love about that is the serious look on his face. And he's here in part because part of the power that I think he offered us was his ability to communicate extraordinarily effectively and poetically coming from not only a vision of how life ought to be, but also from his profound anger at our shortcomings and where we have missed the mark. And uh, I think that anger is an incredibly powerful resource if put to good use. And rather than venting with anger, I think he had, a, he had an ability to capture it and turn it into some, a positive force. And I admire him enormously for his ability to do that. I think in the political context in which we are living right now, the right is much better at being angry and letting us know their anger and tapping into us from a point of anger than the left is. We think we need to be rational and have good arguments and better policies and the world will follow. Well, that hasn't happened. And I think we have denied to ourselves um, the role that anger plays in speaking to one another. And we spent a lot of our energy suppressing the anger, energy that ought to be spent convincing our voters uh, that we've actually got a better way. So thank you, Bobby Kennedy, for an opening to learn about that. I applied to graduate school in history. I enrolled as a, in the graduate program in history at Brandeis. So went back to my roots. So I was taking classes and then teaching some at Brandeis. Um, developed a proposal for my doctoral dissertation. The topic was looking at 17th century Amsterdam, which became the first full-blown version of a public welfare system. So I spent a year in the archives there looking at the records of some of these early institutions. I had to learn to read the 17th century script and try to sort out what was going on and make connections between that and the culture of the time and understand, try to come to understand what the role was of social welfare and people who were involved in it. Wrote a paper 
which got delivered at a, the American Historical Association meeting at some point. And then after that was over, I felt done. I had said everything I had to say. Um, so struggled for many years afterwards with what felt to be an incomplete dissertation. And I remember on several occasions I said, okay, I'm gonna commit myself to finishing this. And I sat down at what was then a manual typewriter and I started with typing the title page, and the title was to be Poverty and the Poor, Social Welfare in 17th Century Amsterdam. The P and the O on the typewriter did not work. So what showed up on the page was Verdi and the R. And I looked at that, and it had one of these great epiphanies. I realized I was more likely to write a musical comedy by the name of Verdi and the R than this goddamn dissertation that I had lost all interest in. So the next thing that came out of that typewriter after I got it repaired was a letter of resignation to the history department at Brandeis saying, it's been great, I had a wonderful time, thanks for the opportunity, learned a lot, good luck, I'm out of here. I don't regret the journey, but I got to the end of it. One of my favorite TV programs growing up was Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges. That seemed pretty cool to me. So I wanted to become a scuba diver and ultimately did become a scuba diver. And there are lots of stories about that, but save those for another time. So I love being here by the USS Constitution in part because uh, I brought my kids here a generation ago and now I get to come here with my grandchildren. And it's also a perfect intersection of my interest in history and my love of the ocean. When I decided that leaving the world of academe was the right thing to do, it wasn't because I didn't like teaching, it was just I didn't like the setting that I had found myself in, or that, that is higher education in this country. And I woke up one morning with an idea for completely restructuring the undergraduate experience so as to make it an interdisciplinary experience. And the sea seemed like a perfect setting in which to do that. While he thoroughly enjoyed teaching that course, he realized as he was teaching it how broad the spectrum of interest was in the sea. And he wanted to do something that was broader. Jay Kaufman was the pivot point uh, of this endeavor. And so he became the person at the center of this web, this web of people interested in these projects. And as we went forward, Jay was our guide, our leader, as we came together to develop this course, which eventually became a course called Into the Ocean World. And through a series of pretty significant steps, we formed an 18 college consortium, set it up as an independent nonprofit, and we retooled that several times over the years, but that became the flagship program for what became the Massachusetts Bay Marine Studies Consortium. Got some encouragement to try to find some role that the consortium could play and I could play in the public policy arena. And this was in the very early days of the Boston Harbor cleanup. So I invented something called the Boston Harbor Mass Bay Symposium. So we started this annual symposium series inviting the scientific community to make presentations on current research, inviting the public policy community to come in and listen to it, and also to give some guidance as to what kind of research would inform public policy making. And all the while the advocacy community was coming in and telling us what needed to happen to clean up Boston Harbor. I suspect perhaps it was as we discussed policy matters, uh, ocean policy, maritime policy, that perhaps that was might have alerted Jay to politics. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, Mark and Carrie, and thanks all of you for being here. And actually, having been given two minutes, I will take about half that, simply because I want to say thank you. Uh, it has been a remarkable privilege of a lifetime to serve in your name at the State House for the last 23 and a half years. And I will say in advance, in, let me say in advance that it will have been an enormous privilege for 24 years. Uh, there's plenty of time for farewells. I, that's, tonight is not the night for that. 
Uh, it's just a time for me to remember what it was like standing up here the first time um, and asking for your vote and to thank you. My for those career and life were at an interesting crossroads. Uh, I got a call from Steve Doran, who was our state representative, with whom I'd had a whole bunch of conversations about what life was like for him as a state rep and what the issues were. And I guess I was interested enough to let him think that I might be interested in running. So when he decided not to run for re-election, he called me and suggested I, this was a good time to be thinking about it. I saw the picture of him standing at a podium talking when he was in you know, high school, running for you know, school council or whatever that was at the time. I mean, he's just sort of born to do this. My idea of politicians and politics then were not such that I thought looking in the mirror and seeing a politician was a very good idea. And the thought of a bunch of rubber chicken dinners and all the things that I associated with politics just were a major turnoff. But I was intrigued enough and, and old enough, wise enough, I guess, to know that I should just let this percolate for a little while. And Jay thought that he needed some time to think about it. And I, I said, okay, well, take the time to think about it, but I think this is the most natural thing for you to be doing. I always thought that, that he was a campaign waiting to happen. <laughs> um, and uh, it was just very natural to move in that direction. This party has been a real community effort, just like Jay's time in the legislature has been all about community and drawing on the community's um, you know, intellect and depth. And um, so, Jay, I just, I want to thank you for, sorry, for making us so proud all these years. For your incredible integrity, just impeccable integrity, and your respect for all people, even if you disagree with them. And I want to thank you for being my life partner and my political partner, my advocacy partner. Um, I just love you so much. And I'm, th I'm glad you let us do this party, <laughs> even, though, <laughs> even though you think it's something other than what it is. <laughs> this is a shot of my son, Kenneth, who leapt into my arms on election night, first time around, when it looked like I was going to lose, and in fact won, um, after what to him must have seemed like a hopelessly endless campaign when I was probably a little bit distracted. So he was quite happy with the results, and I was quite happy with him. So I love that picture. And then the picture above it is a picture of my two boys, Kenneth and Noah, standing with me the first time I was sworn in. I remember walking in here for the first time, and uh, certainly when I was sworn in, I'm not sure how much of the oath I actually said because of the lump in my throat. So this is my home in the chamber. Uh, when I was first elected, I sat towards the back. And then midway through my first term, the seat became vacant. I requested it uh, in part because I like being in the center of things. This is a good a perch from which to begin conversations with colleagues. And in particular, since many of the minority representatives are immediately to my right, speaking physically, not just politically, um, with the leadership of the Republican Party in the front row directly across here, we have a lot of good conversations. The first few years was just wonderfully exciting, steep learning curve. Then there was a period of time after the speaker I was serving under originally left office and he was succeeded by Tom Finneran, whose idea of leadership is, well, he spelled leadership D-O-M-I-N-A-T-I-O-N. So he and I fought like cats and dogs for a while. And I was rewarded for those fights by committee assignments that were less than desirable. And by the inability to get anything passed. So anything that I really cared about, all my legislation I had to give to other people to do because anything with my name on it did not pass go, did not collect $200, went directly to jail. That was that period, which was 
in retrospect, an enormously important period. I learned one hell of a lot about myself, about leadership, about the legislative process. It's, it was, in some ways was the richest time in the State House. This is absolutely my favorite spot in the building, the Hall of Flags. And directly overhead is a stained glass representation of the seals of the original 13 colonies. And what comes to mind as I walk in here is that when I was first elected, all that stained glass had been removed because after years and years of cigar smoke and other forms of smoke, the sun could hardly penetrate. So they were removed for cleaning. At the time, there was this huge baggie hanging there. When the work was completed and that black plastic was removed, the sun came through much as it is right now. And after having been dark and, and pretty insignificant, all of a sudden this room started to shine again. And it was a very, very moving experience. Then once I started learning those lessons, there was a different speaker, and I started getting uh, appointed to the chairmanship of committees. And then I learned what it was like to run a committee. And I learned a lot about the policy areas that I had been assigned. In the first case, it was the uh, Committee on Public Service, which dealt with all public sector employees, labor law, uh, all sorts of employment issues. So that was an area that I really didn't know terribly well at all, if at all. And then I was named a committee chair for the Revenue Committee, which was tax policy, about which I knew even less. So in each of those cases, the, the learning curve was really exciting. Got to work with a whole new bunch of people and a whole bunch of different issues. First of all, we're friends, and we've known each other for a very long time. And um, we've watched a lot of changes and a lot of things happen uh, over the course of the years that we've known each other. Uh, we are very, very closely politically aligned. I don't, I don't think there's much space between us. <laughs> you know, he, he kind of represents anything that needs to be done in the House. I represent anything that needs to be done in the Senate. We um, work together to make sure that we understand what the needs are and that we can address them honestly and quickly. This is Nurses Hall, so named for the dedication to the nurses who served in the Civil War. And until very recently, uh, the nurse in this sculpture was the only female represented in any of the iconography or any of the names on the walls uh, in this building. Before that, it was all dead white men. Um, so she's the first woman to represent the 50% plus part of the population that is female. We are still a fair distance from balancing the genders in the representation in the building and more importantly in the representation in the House. When I was first elected in 94, about one in four members was female. Now, 24 years later, one in four members is female. So we have yet to come anywhere close to rebalancing ourselves uh, to represent the population that we serve. Well, I, I got some very good advice um, from folks at the State House early on. And it wasn't difficult advice to follow because it was resonant with who I am and how I feel anyway. Their words were, nobody ever lost an election for spending too much time at the State House. People have lost elections for not spending enough time in their districts and paying attention to their constituents. Good evening and welcome to tonight's open house. We come here every month to look at an important piece of public policy to see what we can learn from folks who are engaged in that area and to see what we can learn from one another so that as a community we can make better decisions and that so I as your representative uh, can do a better job on your behalf. Tonight, Open House was, and to the, to the best of my knowledge, still is the only series that involves a live audience where you don't really know what's going to happen next. A lot of my colleagues do talking heads kind of programs in studio uh, that struck me as kind of boring. 
the current challenges that we face with regard to wealth and income inequality, I think is an existential threat to democracy. I do From the beginning, this has been somewhat unscripted, in fact, very unscripted, which I like a lot, because I never know what's going to happen. Uh, and at least as much I like the process of figuring out what topics to cover and who to have in as guests with some experience or expertise in those topics. Because it's, it's like figuring out what matters. What are the issues of the day that people are interested in? What are the issues that I am going to have to make some decisions about that I really don't know enough about that I would do well to inform myself better with the talent and expertise and experience of people living in the district as well as for other people who might come in as resources for us. And tonight we're focusing in on elections and quite frankly I despair of the future of democracy in this country given some of the challenges we're facing uh, in, our, in our elections. So it's been a, an ongoing seminar for me to keep me sort of intellectually challenged and hopefully better informed. And I think it's been a really valuable way to have communication with my constituency about some of the important issues. If I get to hear from them, they get to hear from me. And we get to think and learn together. So that's, that's given me an enormous amount of satisfaction. Good night. Thanks for being here tonight. I would never have guessed that I was going to run 12 times. I, again, was old enough to know that it didn't make any sense to run for a position in the State House if I wasn't planning to stay for a little while because it would take a while to get my footing and get anything done. But if you had asked me then how long I would expect to be in office, I would have said probably no less than six, but no more than 10 years. Every year at around this time, I give some serious thought to um, whether I want to run for another term or not. It's, we have two-year terms, and it's worth wondering about the balance of victories and defeats, um, successes and failures, opportunities taken, opportunities missed, and the like. As I was as I contemplating uh, the end of my legislative career, what came to mind was um, a line from a community activist involved with Oxfam um, by the name of Eforistu Matsuari. And about 40 or so years ago, Oxfam held a conference to try to pull together their community organizers to try to distill the important messages about leadership. So as I heard the story told, um, Eforistu Matsuari from Zimbabwe stood up after three days of back and forth on the subject and said, I don't quite understand why this, is why this is apparently so complicated. A good leader loves the people, tells the truth, and knows when to go away. And I'd like to think I told the truth. I do love the people. And it was time for me to go away. And um, to begin with the punchline for this evening, it's time for me to go away. Um, I have to admit that in the days immediately after leaving office, the silence was stunning. No phone calls, no emails, and it was striking how I went from uh, 60 miles an hour to zero overnight. And at first I was disorienting, um, and then I began to appreciate the fact that there was some quiet. Uh, that, that actually served, served me well and that I enjoyed. Some of it I filled with a lot of piano playing. So leaving office has been very good for my piano playing and my piano lessons. Noah, you get the last question of the evening. <clears throat> I'm Noah, I'm Jay's oldest son. So I'd just like to share um, a story that has sort of stuck with me. Um, it must have been five or six years ago, and I remember that because I had just graduated from law school, and I was living at home, and I wasn't paying rent, and I felt very guilty about that, so I figured I had to carry my weight somehow, 
And so what I did was I, I, I went down to Stop and Shop and I was collecting signatures for his re-election campaign. <laughs> uh, and I, I remember very clearly it was, it was getting dark and it was starting to rain and so I, I was packing up. I had a little table with his, his sign there and I was starting to pack it up. And um, an, an older African-American gentleman who was coming into the store came up and said, hold on, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to sign that paper. Um, and he, he said, <laughs> I'm choking you. <laughs> <clears throat> he said, um, you know, 20-odd uh, years ago when your dad was first running, um, he, or, uh, sorry, um, in this very spot, he, he asked me to sign his paperwork. Uh, and he said, no one had ever asked me before because they just assumed that I couldn't afford to live here. <clears throat> and so it stuck with me because his, his service and his policy achievements are, are important, but he treated everyone that he dealt with with respect. It's just about two years since I left the State House. Uh, much has changed over those two years. Um, but a lot has remained the same. We have the same kind of challenges that we've, we've been facing all along in terms of social and economic justice, environmental justice, new consciousness around matters of race. That has, in, in, in a modest kind of way, shaped how I look back on my career and how I look at my new career um, with Beacon Leadership Collaborative. First, in terms of looking back, I think the two signature issues that come to mind are my support for METCO and uh, my advocacy for the fair share amendment to the Constitution. Both of those were works in progress when I left the State House two years ago, and both have been advanced in the time since then, which gives me an enormous sense of satisfaction and I'll admit a modicum of pride. Uh, METCO is in stronger shape now than it was two years ago and in stronger, much stronger shape than it was 24 years ago, 26 years ago now, when I first entered the State House. And that's a really important racial desegregation program made only more important by circumstances over the last couple of decades. And then the Fair Share Amendment to the Constitution is the single most important step to addressing our economic injustice and the disproportionately low tax burden that the wealthiest among us face and the corollary disproportionately high burden that the poorest among us face. So the Fair Share Amendment will go a long distance to address that. Like many of us, I took enormous encouragement from the 2018 voting results and the resurgence of real voices, real important voices uh, in the political dialogue and the number of victories won by progressives specifically. And then the 2020 election obviously was enormously important to get rid of Trump, uh, which was goal number one, two, and three. But also the number of people who voted, I look at it as, as encouragement. And I think some of it was a reflection of the fact that we, the people, are beginning to realize that the government is us and we can't just sit around and complain about the government and then not do anything about it. The concern is that actually being active and engaged citizen takes a lot of work. It's easier to just sit back and let somebody else do it. So the test really over the next little while is whether we the people are up to the challenge. all in his debt for the incredible effort that he has made throughout his career and it's just the end of one chapter and the beginning of another one where he mentors a whole new generation of leaders who will be fighting for the very same causes genetically hardwired by their association with Jay Kaufman. Thank you Jay for everything that you have done.